I'm Lieutenant Samuel Johnson. The year is 1800. John Adams is the President of the United States. There's an election coming up pretty soon. And John Adams is going to be squaring off with Thomas Jefferson. But here in Wilkes County, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience at the Battle of Kings Mountain. It was back in the year 1780. And that particular summer was a gloomy year for the American cause. As Charleston had fallen in spring of 1780, and then in August of 1780, in mid-August, we lost the Battle of Camden in Camden, South Carolina, where General Horatio Gates was defeated by Lord Cornwallis in a battle that Gates took his army in there hastily prepared against a formidable force in Cornwallis's dug-in army, essentially, at Camden. After the Battle of Camden, it looked bad for the American cause. But here in the mountains, and then the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains along the Atkin River, we had hope that the resistance of the over-mountain men could maybe answer the call. We got that chance to answer the call in September 1780. At that particular time, a commander under Cornwallis, Major Patrick Ferguson, uh, was sent by Cornwallis out into the foothills of North Carolina with this message. Scottish-born Patrick Ferguson, I'll almost hear in his voice today this ultimatum. If you do not desist from opposition to British arms, I will march my army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay waste to your countryside with fire and sword. That message resonated to the backwaters of the Yadkin River. Here in Wilkes County, we had Colonel Benjamin Cleveland. The next day, we rode in towards uh, the Yadkin River west to the old Mulberry Fields site, which is where we're standing today, and to meet up with Colonel Cleveland and the Wilkes County men. Together with the Winston and Cleveland forces, we had 350 men. From there, we moved west to Fort Defiance and met with uh, with uh, Captain William Lenore. And from here, they, from that direction, Quaker Meadows, they moved to follow Ferguson. They went to a place a few days later called Old Gilbert Town. It's where Ferguson had delivered his ultimatum. But Ferguson was gone. So they continued on their quest to Ferguson, headed southwest. They thought he was initially going to 96 South Carolina, which is a British outpost. But a few days later, reconnaissance and information gathered by spies who were sent out, most notably one spy, 16-year-old Enoch Gilmer, who was, who, who was with the South Fort Boys of the Catawba River. He was sent out because he had known acting skills, and he used that skill to find out the position of Ferguson. They ended up chasing Ferguson to a low mountain along the South Carolina, North Carolina border. The night before they made their final push, they were at a place called Hannah's Cowpens, which is an old cowpen area and livestock holding area in South Carolina, not too far from the Broad River. They, they left that particular campsite that night, riding through the driving rain in the quest of Ferguson. Our commander recall hearing Isaac Shelby say, well, I'll, find, I'll follow Ferguson into Cornwallis's lines if it's necessary. The patriotism amongst our brethren was very strong. Colonel Cleveland even had remarked on the march, such commands as, my brave fellows, we have faced the enemy before. We must up and at them with a skill and determination that we can muster. The next day, as the Overmountain men had ridden their horses through driving rain the night before the Battle of Kings Mountain, the sun came out about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we had encircled the mountain. From the north well, the side of the mountain, the Virginians and the Tennesseans launched their attack. We were on the southern side of the mountain with Winston and Cleveland. The Overmountain men circled the mountain, fighting Indian style tree to tree with the skill of Pennsylvania rifles. Their attrition 
were able to eventually make a difference. Squeezing the Loyalist force under Patrick Ferguson to the top of the mountain. Ferguson, a couple of days before the battle, had made the prediction, obviously, and prophetically, that not even God Almighty would move him to the mountain. Well, Ferguson is there today because he was killed as the forces began to evaporate the attrition of the long rifles made the difference in fighting the British, who were on top of the mountain, fighting largely with bayonet and smoothbore. But the accuracy of the Pennsylvanian rifle with the rifled barrel sends the bullet out as if it were a spiral like a football. And this spiraling bullet makes them very accurate for long distances. Furthermore, the over-mountain men were armed with throwing axe and hunting knife. This was the counter of the British Loyalist bayonet charges. Many of their bayonets were smooth bores. Many of them had been modified to accept what we call a stick bayonet, which was inserted, made from a carved piece of, of a knife inserted into the rifle butt to use for a makeshift bayonet. So over, over mountain men fighting guerrilla style behind a tree and through brush and bramble with her throwing axe, with her hunting knife, the long knife as it's often referred to, to counter the British loyalist bayonet charge. I was actually hit in the battle seven times. Somebody had saw me laying there under a tree and I'm still yet conscious but going in ebbing in and out of consciousness I learned that Ferguson had been shot and killed. And I instructed some of my comrades, if you could just get me to see Ferguson, I believe there's a good chance that I can survive. Come to find out later, the physicians who helped restore me and bring me back to medical, uh, my medical condition and survive the battle indicated since I hadn't eaten several hours that perhaps I survived the battle because I had a gut shot, which was my most serious wound. And there was not much food and much blood in my stomach, so I did not bleed to death, and I'm here today. How important was Kings Mountain? After the Battle of Kings Mountain, the Over Mountain men shouted huzzas from the top of the mountains, the old equivalent that people have cheers today uh, in the army. And after the Battle of Kings Mountain, Cornwallis retreated into South Carolina. One year after the Battle of Kings Mountain, the Battle of Yorktown took place in which Cornwallis was trapped by the combined forces of Lafayette from the French Army and General George Washington from the American forces. So Kings Mountain was that tide, of, as Thomas Jefferson said, it was the tide of change that resulted in American freedom. Considering that, it's proud to be here in the year 1800, in Old Mulberry Fields, where they're laying out the town of Wilkesboro to replace the old town of Mulberry Fields, but it's proud that we were able to make a difference. Just a bunch of farm boys along the Yadkin River and turning the tide for success for the American cause. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with OVTA, that's the Over Mountain Victory Trail Association. Our first segment will be done by Buck Stewart. Buck is going to be talking to you about primitive survival skills in the 18th century life along the Over Mountain Victory Trail. My name is Buck Stewart. I'm one of the volunteers at Wilkes Heritage Museum. And what I want to discuss today is uh, about primitive uh, camping and about the uh, the way that uh, men in the uh, 18th century would have lived in the wild uh, or traveled through the wild. Uh, now the the big thing that's different 
between what we see mostly today in backpackers and whatnot uh, and how they live, modern outdoorsmen are backpackers. But the men in the 18th century that were long hunters and uh, were uh, military uh, men that were traveling in, in uh, the way of reaching battle points uh, lived and used a completely uh, different sort of, of position. For example, they made their trips in groups, not as single individual men. Now, modern day backpackers, they go as pretty much single people. They packed in their uh, material. When them, if you look at the modern day people, they would carry their stuff in and say things like this bag that you see here, over the shoulder. Uh, today, uh, you would have a backpack on your, uh, with a, a, a uh, frame and you'd carry the stuff in that way. They didn't carry it that way. Other things they carried in that was significant, uh, they would carry their bedrolls and that would generally be an oil cloth. I'm using a, a piece of canvas here for my ground cloth, but they would generally be using oil cloths. And they would have in that uh, oil cloth a blanket. They would have a blanket in that. They'd probably have uh, another shirt because, you know, they were going to be traveling in the weather and sometimes uh, that would be necessary for them to uh, have uh, some clothing to that. But they'd have, that's all they'd have. Modern day backpackers would be sleeping in down filled sleeping bags. So there's really no comparison to what uh, these, these men uh, survived in and used to survive uh, compared to what modern day guys do. Uh, some other things that uh, we might mention with respect to that. Let's start out with what they'd, <laughs> what it would all be about, the flintlock rifle, okay? Uh, and this is uh, a version of that flintlock rifle. I'll show the shower of sparks with that. And uh, that was the main thing that they were going into battle with, so that they uh, were very particular about taking care of that item. They uh, carried a lot of food stuff with them. I mean, things like, uh, uh, here it would be like uh, cornmeal uh, and uh, some, some of the northern people might have brought down wild rice for them, which is really a grass seed, but uh, that would be the sort of thing. They'd use a lot of dried meat, dried beef, things of that nature. I've got these in order that I uh, would have them on my belt, but this is what they would have. They would have a tomahawk like this. Uh, this is a example of the tomahawk that they would carry with them like that. Uh, generally speaking, that would be on their left side. Uh, and then going around the back, toward the back and getting over to, uh, to the right hip, they might have, for example, uh, a small, like a skinning knife, a small knife. But uh, as we go on around toward the front and to the, to the right side, they would have a large hunting knife. Now this was a weapon as much as anything else. It wasn't uh, like that little skinning knife. This was something that they may have to use in a battle. Then in front of the, in the right side, not exactly in front, but on the right side in front of that knife, they would have a pouch that would contain their 
bullets, ammunition, things like uh, their rifle balls. Let me get some of this stuff out here. This is a, a, a tool that they would use to clean out the uh, little port hole. And they would have patches to put on top of the rifle barrel and then put the lead ball on it and ram it down into the barrel after they'd poured the powder in, of course. But that, that would be something they'd have in there. Of course, they wouldn't have had them in plastic bags like this, but that would have been, uh, that's a good way for me to store them at any rate. Well, I need to talk about something else to hang around their neck. Wouldn't be any use to go and carry this flintlock rifle if you didn't carry more ammunition than those lead balls and such. So they'd have a powder horn. Generally, this is kind of a short one. Uh, generally, the powder horns were at least 12 inches long that they carried. Uh, this is a kind of a decorative sort of thing, and it isn't really the size that probably they would have carried uh, to keep their powder going to the Battle of Kings Mountain. Generally, they'd have a little hunting pouch of some sort hung over a shoulder. In that hunting pouch, they might have, uh, for example, here's some things to do flint and steel. And they might, they'd also have uh, a little pouch that would have extra flints for that flintlock rifle. Uh, that would be another one of the things that they would probably have in a little pouch uh, in this hunting sack. This little bird nest of uh, hemp material is what they would use as tinder to start a fire. They'd have, of course, uh, the material that we're gonna burn. I don't have that here. I'm just gonna see if I can get the, the uh, ignition material to go. And uh, what they'd usually do with that, they'd have, a piece of steel and a flint. If you strike that flint the right way, you can see a, a spark come off of it and you'd put that down into your tinder and start your fire with that. Now I fudged on you a little bit, but this is a this is a time saver for me using the uh, <laughs> fire steel as opposed to the to the flint and steel. The flint and steel will work, but it's not it's not very uh, rapid in getting it to do it. I'm RG Epster with the Wilkes Surrey Chapter of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association and this next segment will feature Greg Jones and Doug Mitchell giving a demonstration and a talk on period weapons of the 18th century. Good day everyone, how are you? My name is Greg. I'm Doug. And we're here to talk about 18th century weapons and what you might see uh, through the Battle of Kings Mountain and what the Surrey Militia might be training here with during their two weeks in militia school. Doug, why don't you talk about the weapon here? Sure. Today? This one right here is a 62 caliber, uh, they call it a light dragoon pistol. It's a flintlock, and a flintlock, I'll give the basics of it. Uh, the, all these weapons are exactly the same, just different shapes and sizes, but uh, it uses a piece of flint here, which is a stone. It's sharpened, and then this is a frizzen right here. It's a piece of steel. So you got flint and steel, you get fire. Uh, the, it moves at such a good pace, and it's got a nice edge to it. It actually shaves off a little piece of steel, which, which will drop down in this pan here, which is filled with gunpowder. There's a small hole in there, the gunpowder ignites there, goes into there where we've pre previously put a, uh, a charge of gunpowder and a, and a musket ball, and ignites the gunpowder and sends the, the ball down the field. 
Um, each one is the same. Do you want to keep going or? Okay. Yeah, okay. This one right here is the brown vest. This is uh, a, a weapon that was made uh, from roughly 1725 to about 1838 for over a hundred years. This is some form of this was used by the British Army, by Americans, uh, but it's the same thing. You got flint here, you got a piece of steel here, the same thing, a pan, same exact thing as was with the pistol. And uh, the difference with this right here is the British, when they used it, every gun for the most part was exactly alike. So if, if my buddy's uh, hammer broke, I could give him another one. Uh, if the frizzen broke, you could get another one. Uh, same thing, the ramrod, everything was the same. And that's what, what made it a unique piece of equipment. Uh, this is a 75 caliber uh, weapon and it uses a 69 caliber ball, which is right about one ounce. So you have an ounce of lead traveling down the field uh, at a pretty good click. Now this is a musket. A musket is just a, basically a smooth pipe. And when it, the ball takes off, because you're using a 69 caliber and a 75 caliber barrel, it, there's a lot of rattle room right in there. So up close within 50 yards is pretty good. And the farther you go, the worse it gets. So at about 100 yards, the ball has, if you aimed here, has already dropped 18 inches, roughly. Um, so uh, this right here, you think, well, it's, that's a sight that is not a sight. It's actually a, thank you, sir. Okay. It's a lock for putting a bayonet onto it. And what makes the Brown best a, a neat instrument is because now you've got a six foot spear that shoots at people. So if you run out of bullets, you've still got a weapon. Uh, what they would do is they would line up and they would shoot at each other uh, about 50 yards away, hopefully more or less. But anyway, they would volley a whole bunch of shots down the uh, thing. It would uh, hopefully confuse the people, frighten the people, and then they would charge with their bayonets and hopefully scatter them. Um, so that's the difference between this and this. Like I said, uh, this, this would be a unique piece made by a local gunsmith. So this, this hammer would not work here. Nothing would, would work other than the piece of flint, which is universal between all three instruments. Um, you want to take off with the, the musket? So we're looking at the difference between a formerly trained and formerly equipped British Army next to a band of militia or citizen soldiers. So as Doug talked about, the British Army is going to be issued this brown vest with a bayonet, with a scabbard, and more importantly over here, a cartridge box in which you keep your cartridges in. For the American militia, this is what you can bring from home. Maybe your colony is rich enough to supply arms and the stand of arms and clothing, but most of the time when the militia call goes out, it's what we can bring from home. So most Americans you see showing up are bringing what we would consider small squirrel rifles or small squirrel muskets or rifled muskets. That's what you might see going on here. The big difference, you see the stock goes all the way up to the end of the barrel to support it. You can't fix the bayonet to it, so you have to decide, do you want to shoot or do you want to run? And that's a pretty big part because the bayonet is used effectively against the American militia several times. When the Americans know when they hear the command to fix bayonets, uh, I don't have to outrun you. I just have to outrun everybody else to get out of there. So getting uh, caught in the bayonet charge is pretty significant. Now the difference between these uh, is being a smooth bore musket. This is actually a rifled musket or a rifled musket and it has grooves cut in the barrel. It's cut by a gunsmith. They have to be precise enough and have a certain twist over a number of inches to stabilize a musket ball. When you get into the heat of battle, black powder produces fouling. It becomes a little bit tougher and longer to reload this versus a smooth bore musket. So the rate of fire goes to the British who are carrying us as well as the other Americans, but the accuracy of fire goes to carrying the rifle. With this coming from home, you'll be issued, if you don't have your own, a powder horn, as well as a shot bag. Now this creates a problem for fighting because in a powder horn, you need to uncap this, measure out powder, pour it into the pan, measure out another charge, put it down the barrel, ram down the charge, put the ramrod back, and then fire. When you're working with a cartridge out of a cartridge box, what you see over here, they have pre-made paper cartridges that they can use with their teeth to tear them open find that in and then pour the rest of the charge down there so you can speed up your loading time by using a cartridge. This is good for hunting, but rabbits and squirrels, they don't shoot back. You want to have a cartridge box. The difference too, like you said with yours, you might have a rate of about one 
Yeah, one one, shot, one shot, shot at a minute. Whereas with this, three is a, is good, four is really good. But it's so about every 15 to 20 seconds it takes to reload this, where this is one minute to do this. And the heat of battle, that probably changes quite a bit too. Um, yeah. I'm sure ramrods get snapped off or stuck. Uh, yeah. Muskets are loaded incorrectly, double charged, triple charged, and then your, your bomb waiting to go off. Yeah. So, so yeah. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with wilkes Surrey Chapter of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. This next segment will feature drilling and period use of weapons up in a militia format with Gordon Myers and wilkes Surrey reenactors. So the, the music back then, um, a lot of people think of music, they think of um, dancing and, and you know music for, for pleasure. But there was also music that they played back then during the Revolutionary War that was used as communication. They didn't have radios or anything like that to be able to talk back and forth when they're in the battle. So they would use things like the drum. Um, they also had a th another instrument called a fife that they would use. It's a, a short wooden flute, basically. Um, and they would use those to, to relay commands um, of what people needed to do whether it's in camp, during the battle, while they're marching, uh, but it was really important to have these because the sound of the drum will carry a lot further than a man's voice. Especially if you're in battle and you have the, the muskets going off and cannon fire and people yelling, if you have the commander that's in the middle of a long line of, of his soldiers and he's trying to tell them what to do, they're not really going to be able to hear him that well, if they can hear him at all. So they would use the drummers to be able to, to play something that would relay his commands to everybody else. Um, so everybody knew what was going on. Um, the, the drum, it's a very simple instrument. Um, it's not made like the, the drums today, if a lot of you are, are used to, to seeing those. Um, it's wood right here. Um, it was held together by, by rope. And these had to be tightened by these leather ears um, to be able to bring the, the drum together real tight to give you that, that nice drum sound. Um, the head of the drum uh, is not plastic like they use today. They actually used uh, calf skin. So calf is, is a baby cow and they would use the, the skin to be able to cover up the top of it. It's very durable, um, it's, it's waterproof. So it was a very good uh, uh, thing to use for the head of the drum. And then the snares on the bottom a lot of times today when you look at the, the snares, it's a, a little metal, uh, looks like a spring going across there. This is actually cat gut. Um, they would uh, dry it out and put it on there and that's what would give the, the snare sound. Um, so they, they were not wasteful people back then. They used anything and everything they could. Um, and they, they would uh, use these um, you know, as often as they could for the communication. So I'm just gonna show you a few things that, that they would have um, used back then. Um, whenever they needed to get all the musicians together so they could start playing, um, they had musicians call. Um, and they would get one person out there, usually a drummer, um, and they would start playing. And then when the musicians heard it, they would all come uh, running together. They'd all start playing. And once everybody was there, they would stop and then continue with what they needed to do. So this is what the drummer's part of musicians call sounds like. They would just do it over and over and over till everybody was there. Um, whenever they needed to get all the men together, all the soldiers, when they were getting ready to uh, do inspection or if they needed to, um, to go march, go to battle, whatever they're getting ready to do, um, they would uh, uh, play a, a, a tune to get all the, all the soldiers together so they um, knew that it was time to, to gather and, and go to whatever needed to be done. So. Uh, this is this is what that would sound like for the, um, all the, the soldiers for them to come together. Again, over and over till everybody was there. Now they had other other things that they would do um, if they needed the officers together because they had a meeting. There was a tune they could play for that. If they needed the adjutants, if they needed. Um, 
if it was time to eat, if it was time to, uh, to go to church, to get up in the morning, go to bed, uh, they needed f uh, water, they needed firewood, anything, they had something that they could play um, on the drum to be able to get it out across the camp so everybody could hear and they knew that something needed to happen. So it was very important. Now, one thing is uh, this right here isn't completely accurate. Um, I, I'm a little too old to be playing the drums. Uh, most of the, uh, the drummers back then were actually around 9, 10, 11 years old. So the dad would, would join up uh, to, to fight in the army and his son would want to, to be with him. You know, he wanted to be by, by his dad's side. So he, he would sign up to be a musician. Like I said, most of them were right around 10 years old. So you're gonna have you know, these, these lines of soldiers in the battle and behind them, you're gonna have the officers and, and the musicians. And it sounds like a really safe place to be, okay? You're back behind everybody. But the musicians were actually targets because the other side knew that if they could take out a drummer, that they wouldn't be able to get the commands to everybody else. So it's, it's sad to think about, you know, having to aim at a 10-year-old at a kid um, with, with your, your rifle or your musket, but that's what they did because they needed to stop that line of communication. Um, and, and if something happened to them, there was always somebody else that would be able to step up into their place to continue going because they had to keep that communication going. Um, so it, it was a, a sad thing, but a lot of, a lot of kids did it. Um, some would start off with this and then uh, graduate and, and become a soldier later on. Some just like playing the drums, they keep doing it. Um, so the, the music, the drums, very, very important during that time. Um, they had to get those orders out to everybody. They had to get, let everybody know what was going on. Um, so that's, that's why they had to have that back then. And it was just so important um, to, to have multiple people that knew how to play. Uh, the larger the, uh, the, the group was, the more soldiers, the more drummers you had to have. So it depended on, on what kind of um, size you had to how many drummers you needed. And I've heard this question many times, well, don't you want, uh, not want the other side to, to hear what you're playing because they, you know, they don't want you to know what's, what's going on. Well, in battle, you're not really going to be paying attention to what the other side's doing. Um, they're playing their drums, we're playing our drums to get the orders out. But if I'm paying attention to what they're doing, I'm not gonna be able to pay attention to, to what my commanding officers tell me to do. So that wasn't really an issue back then. Um, they would just pay attention to what they were needing to do, what their commanding officer was telling them to do, and that, that's what needed to be done. Um, they didn't really have any weapons on them. They couldn't carry a rifle or a musket. So a lot of them would, would carry you know, a knife of some sort. They might have a tomahawk, which looks like a little hatchet. Um, it, some, some kind of small things that they could use hand-to-hand -hand combat if, if they needed to. Um, they, they would have a musician's sword. Uh, most of the, the, the officer musicians would have those, um, but that, that was really about it. They're not going to be shooting any guns or anything like that because they had a more, more important job to be able to get those, those orders out. So I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, young ladies and young men. You have now joined the militia. When you left the quill pen writing, the paper you have in your hand signed you up for the Army. And it's my job to make you into soldiers. And at this time, we will try to do that. Okay, here's my soldiers right here. We start, each one of you, arm's length apart. This is to give you plenty of room to maneuver and not hit each other in the head and whatever when you're issued your little rifle. Okay. Face me, you gotta follow my instructions to the letter so it'll all come together. Face the right. Face me. Face the right. Face me. Face left. Face me. Face the rear. Face me. Okay, you're a one, you're two, you're one. If we were getting ready to march in columns, I would have the number two man to take a step back and move up beside number one. And then number one move up behind number one beside of him. And that'll put you in a straight column to march. Okay, now that you can follow orders on your face right, Face, face me, face left, 
face the rear and face me. This is your normal commands. At this time, I'll issue you a rifle and then we'll learn your rifle commands. All right. Your first is to be at ease. Bring your rifle down by your side and hold it here. Will be called order arms. Okay, you may be getting ready to march, so you'll come up with your rifle and go to support arms. Okay, now you're on the move. You need to be a little more comfortable, so we'll go to what to call a right shoulder shift. That's where you take your rifle, turn it over here, put it on your shoulder, just like that. And you keep your rifles up like this so you don't be turning around hitting the person beside of you and behind you in the head with a gun barrel. Okay. At this time, we'll learn to, our gun drills. Uh, order arms. Support arms. Right shoulder shift. Back to order arms. Support arms. Right shoulder shift. Okay. Face the right. Now at this time we'll do our marching. Step it off. March. Halt. Face the rear. Face me. Face the left. Number two, move up beside number one. Number one. March. Halt. Face me. Now, if you can see what I've done here, I've made a double column out of this. And that's by having count offs of ones and twos. You always remember your number now. Number two, take a step to the right. Number one, take a step to the right. Stay where you get. Come forward. All right. Well, this right here is your normal drill to learn to be a soldier. So we look forward to seeing you at our next OVTA event next fall. You be here and I'll uh, teach you how to be a soldier. Thank you. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with the wilkes -Surrey chapter of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. And the next demonstration will be Burl Childers that's going to talk about 18th century currency and other artifacts of the period. Hello, my name is Burl Childers. I'm here to give a demonstration on currency and a few artifacts. And what we'll start with today is there was a shortage of currency in the colonies in 1780 for the simple reason the king's idea of the colonies was to make him money not for him to furnish them money. So he wouldn't allow the British to bring currency over here. So the first things that was used, of course we had the French coming out of what is now Canada. They were trading with, to the Indians for their furs. They was using trade beads and they'd trade for the furs and they'd take them and sell them and make money off of it. So these was the first items. They also had deer skins and beaver pelts. And of course the beaver pelts was the most expensive and they was used to make top hats over in England. And what they traded was the trade beads. 
And here's some examples of the trade beads. And in the colonies, these was the main ones that was used in the colonies for currency. You have the uh, white clamshell beads. I got two different versions of them. Took five of them to make a penny's worth. And then we had the quahog clamshell beads, which you can see the purple in them. And they came from the quahog clamshell, which grows in the ocean, Atlantic Ocean up north where the waters are cold. And they still gather them today. After the beads, in the, in the 1700s, colony of Massachusetts sent some delegates over to England and they asked and got permission to mint coins. And the first coins that was minted in what is now Canada, United States, and Mexico are these three coins right here. This, this is a shilling. These are shillings. These are, then they have a sixpence, which pence is a British word for penny, and then the three pence. These would have been made of silver. They've been bright like this one, which this one is made of silver. And this is this particular one is called a pillow dollar because of the pillows on each side of the globes. And they only made the these silver ones here for only about two months because they were simple. They had any on one side and the value of it, which this is 12 pence as being a shilling, and people could uh, counterfeit them or make fake ones. So then they started making what is called a tree series. Of course, these are shillings, and you have the uh, oak tree, the willow tree, and the pine tree. And of course you have the shillings, it's 12 pence, and then you have the six pence and the three pence. And they started making these in 1682. And after about a year of making these, the parliament sent word back over here that they was gonna have to stop minting coins because the king didn't want them, want them minting them anymore. So the people that was running the colony of Massachusetts got together and says, well, we still need currency. How are we gonna come up with currency? Well, somebody come up with the idea. These are stamped 1652. So just why don't we continue making these coins? And the king wasn't over here and the parliament wasn't over here. They won't know how many we minted. And so that's what they done. They continued minting the coins only they put the year 1652 on them, and, six, and in 1680 they were still minting those coins. Of course, if they'd have got caught, that would have been too bad. Now, another coin I want to talk about that was in the colonies was called a Spanish Mill Silver Dollar. And of course, it is made off of, also of silver, and there is something unique about the Spanish Mill Silver Dollar. If you've ever heard the story or the words uh, pieces of eight or piece of eight, this is what they were talking about. And to give you an example, I made me a coin out of lead because I didn't want to cut my good one up into pieces. That would have been cut into eight pieces. And of course, this is a dollar, a hundred pennies, and each one of these pieces is 12 and a half pennies. And I'm a guessing that a blacksmith would have had a die that he could set on this and cut it into eight equal pieces. Because if they were shaved down and was not the correct size, the merchants would have a pair of scales and they would weigh it. They knew what, how much each piece was weighed. And if it didn't weigh enough, they'd only pay them the corresponding amount of merchandise for that coin. Because people was bad to shave the edges on the coins and take a little silver off of them. Now, that is the currency demonstration. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with the OVTA, well, sorry, chapter of the OVTA, and we also have Gordon Myers uh, today. And we're going to do you some examples of colonial period music. 
Life on the frontier was not without fun and laughter and song and dance. But we didn't have the modern day instruments that you would see today, and you didn't have amplification, obviously. So you had to have musical instruments that were first around during that period, and, for, and secondly, something that's good and loud by itself. We have two instruments today that fit that bill. The first one is the 66 string hammered dulcimer, as it's called. And they did exist in the colonies during the colonial period in towns like Williamsburg or Philadelphia, maybe Savannah, Georgia, or the larger towns, uh, the hammered dulcimer was used as a parlor instrument. And the fiddle was quite a useful instrument. You could play it for barn dances. Sometimes the caller and the dance master was all, the, the fiddle player was all the same person. Because you didn't have large bands that you might have in, the, in Appalachia today with old time and bluegrass. Although the instruments were in the coming in, for instance, Thomas Jefferson documented that the banjo was used on the plantations of Tidewater, Virginia during the colonial period. Uh, the guitar hadn't really come along yet, but it was in development, and there were guitar-like instruments being developed based on the Middle Ages lute instrument that was around. So the guitar was on its way. But obviously, electrified instruments were not around, so we're gonna give you an example of an old Southern Appalachian tune that came out of the mountains, probably based on the Scotch and Irish theme of whiskey and whiskey rebellions. And the name of the tune is called, humorously, Whiskey Before Breakfast. So we'll play a little Whiskey Before Breakfast on the hammered dulcimer and the fiddle. Here it goes. do a tune called St. Anne's Reel and this tune was popular in Ireland Scotland in the 18th century it came across the ocean to America and the story about the tune St. Anne was thought to be the grandmother of Jesus so the song was many times sung around uh, celebrations around the holidays in the colonial frontier as a really neat tune it's lively and we've got some folks that are going to help us with the rhythm section out here this as you would back in the colonial days too but here we go with the saint Anne's drill take it away gordon Okay, back in the 18th century, we had a barn dance. The most popular kind of dance that we're gonna to do today uh, in demonstrations is known as the Virginia Reel. And essentially, in the Virginia Reel, you had a line of ladies and a line of gents facing each other, facing your partner, and you go through a series of dance moves. Today, when we talk about dance, uh, the students that have had dance, here, dance instructors say this all the time, five, six, seven, eight, if you've ever heard that. You don't realize it, but it's a fun way to do math. 
and you can so you essentially count one, two, three, four, five, six. Then I'll call the name of the next step on seven and eight. Then I'll start to count over again. The first dance step that we're gonna learn is uh, ladies, uh, men walk in, men walk in. So men will walk in, take one step in and bow on this command. Men walk in, five, six, seven, men, and then go back to your position. And then uh, on five, and after five, six, I say, ladies walk in and curse it. So instead of bow, curse it. Okay, and then back to your position, try to get back by eight. And then the next dance command is raise your right hand. It's called right hand round. You go to your partner and connect with, uh, connect your hands and spin one time and, and return to your original position. Okay, and return to your original position. Then we'll do left hand round, same thing, but you spin the other way. Left hand round. Now we'll swing your partner, make a chicken wing and go meet your partner and swing with your right chicken wing first. Swing your partner. Now the command swing left, left chicken wing. Now we're gonna do the do -si do You cross your arms like this and you approach your partner's right shoulder and go stay facing in the same direction, go around them and come back to your position. Make sure we don't have a traffic collision here. Okay, do -si do And that's the simple steps that we're going to do today with the uh, Virginia Reel. Let's just get ready. Men walk in. Women walk in. Right hand round. Left hand round. Swing your partner. Swing left. Do see do. Clap along. Dancers get ready. Man walk in. Women walk in. Right hand round. Left hand round. Bring your partner. Men walk in. Ladies walk in. Right hand round. Left hand round. Swing your partner. Do -si -do. One more time, men walk in, ladies walk in, right hand round, left hand round, swing your partner. Do -si -do. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> For the students and teachers love listening to this uh, colonial dance experience. Now try it yourself. Roll the tape back. First practice it. Have the teacher call the dance. And then practice through the dance yourselves in your classroom. Thank you.
Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with Overmountain Victory Trail Association, and Mary Boland will be talking with you about the skill set involved with colonial cooking. Hi, I'm Ms. Mary. Hi, I'm Ms. Eden. Today we're going to show you guys how to make corn cakes like you see here. This is what the militia men on their trek to Kings Mountain would have packed with them or their wives would have made and packed for them so that they would have something to eat on their long trek. Corn was one of the most important crops grown in the back country of North Carolina. Corn was grown, uh, it could be roasted, it could be cut off the cob, uh, and when it dried out, it was ground into a meal that we call corn meal. The men would mix the meal together, just like you see Eden doing right here. They could mix it in a bowl and uh, used hot water. We used hot water with that and that's all it is. Now today you can make cornbread and you can add sugar or molasses to it. You can add uh, bacon grease or buttermilk or eggs, but in the back country, when these men were going to Kings Mountain, they would just have cornmeal and water, and that's what Eden is making today. She's mixing it in a wooden bowl, and then we're gonna put it in a fry pan and cook it on the fireplace, just like the men would have done if they were cooking in the, uh, at the campground uh, out on the trail. We heat up the frying pan uh, to get it warmed up, and we've got some lard in the frying pan to uh, lard is grease, it comes from a hog, and that's what they would have had back then. We're gonna put the uh, little cakes in the corn pan, in the pan, and then put it over the fire. The fire is, uh, today we have the fireplace in the house, but when the men were out on the trip, they would cook it at their campfire along the way, on the river bank or alongside a creek. So Miss Mary is going to rake some of the hot coals from underneath the fire and place them on the hearth. And then when she's done with that, she's gonna set the frying pan on top of it. Now this is how they cooked over the hearth in the 18th century. They didn't have ovens like we see today. This is how they would cook all of their food. Okay, now we're going to flip them over and you can see how nice and brown they are on one side and flip it over again. We'll cook these sides. These look like little pancakes. And that's exactly what they're called, corn cakes. We're going to take the corn cakes off of the frying pan and put them on our wooden dish right here so that they can cool off. And they would be, well, when they cool off, they'll be ready to pack up and put in our pouch to add more to it to take with our men and our boys on the way to Kings Mountain. Now, Eden has a pouch over here, the little leather pouch, and, uh, and also she has a cloth and this is how they would pack it together. Put some of the, we've already made some of the corn cakes so you would see and they could put it together uh, in and wrap it up like you would wrap up a sandwich and put it in their little pouch to take with them. This would have been a common food. They could have taken maybe some apples with them or maybe some dried jerky but a corn cake was one of the most important things that they could take and then they could have that at the campfire or they could make it with them uh, if they were camped overnight. We're very glad that you came and visited with us today at the Heritage Museum. And what we wanted you to know is that the men that lived here in this area, perhaps even one of your ancestors, that went to the Battle of Kings Mountain, they had to pack and be ready to go like they were going on a long trip. And one of the things that they took was corn cakes. Today we have cooked one at the fire so that you can see what it looks like. Thank you for being with us and we hope to see you again soon. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with Overmountain Victory Trail Association and Carrie Maserick will be talking to you about spinning 
in the 18th century. Hi, my name is Miss Carrie, and I don't know about you, but when I went outside this morning, I was cold, and I was thinking about what kind of clothes I was going to put on. Did I want to put on linen or cotton that kept my body really cool? Or did I want to put on wool or silk, cloth that kept my body really, really warm? So I decided to put on some wool to keep my body really warm on this cold morning. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the wool process and how I made my own clothes. Here on the Carolina frontier, we didn't have stores to run off to to get our yarn or to purchase fabric, so we had to make it ourselves. So first thing we had to do was find our sheep. And this sheep is a English breed. It's called a Cotswold. And we have to shear our sheep. This guy's name is Noah. And we have to shear our sheep and with a pair of trimmers like this. And sheep are just like us. We don't have to kill them to get their wool. We just cut their hair. So we're just giving them a haircut. for, And so they're a lot cooler during the summertime. So that's really nice. So we shear them. And when we, after we shear them, this is what their wool looks like. It's really greasy. It's dirty. There's little bits of poop in it. It smells kind of bad, like a barnyard floor. And so I can't spin with this. This isn't very good yarn yet, so I have to wash it just like we wash our hair. So just like we wash our hair, I use warm water and soap to clean it. And after I wash it, it looks like this. Okay, so after I wash it, it's not sticky anymore. The fibers are coming apart, and it's really nice, but it's so tangly, and I still can't use it. So like we comb our hair, I have to comb this wool. And if you all lived in my house with me, this would be part of your job as the children of the household, is to fluff up the wool, clean it, put it on my carters, and these are like our hair combs, and I'm gonna comb my fibers so they're all nice and straight. I get all the tangles out. No more tangles. And then, oops, this is what I can use. Look at how pretty all the fibers are in one direction. If there's any grass or leaves, those carters help get the grass and leaves out of the wool for me, comb everything really straight and nice. But I'm not done yet. This fiber is not very strong like this. So if I twist this fiber here, by twisting it, I make it really strong and it won't break apart easily. So I have a couple tools that I use to help me put a twist in this yarn so I don't have to do it by hand. One tool is called a spindle. And this spindle, you twist the spindle, and the spindle puts twist in my yarn. And I'm gonna show you how that works here. So now, do you think this would take me a long time to make a big chunky yarn? It would take me a little bit of time. Get enough yarn to weave a hat or knit a hat, knit gloves, make socks. So somebody had a great idea. What if we attach a really big wheel to this spindle? And if we attach this really big wheel, it'll make this spindle go ton faster than I could do it just by hand. Really fast. So, if I were on the go, I would use the spindle. 
If I were at my home spinning, I could use this wheel. This wheel is called a great wheel, a high wheel, a walking wheel, a wool wheel. It has all sorts of names and it really makes my spinning go a little bit quicker if I'm right at home. So this is how it works. I'm going to spin my wheel and feed, give my wheel some twist. And it's twisting my yarn, my fiber to make it good and strong. And then my second step is I have to go in reverse and wind it on and keep on going. This has made spinning so much faster for me and I can produce quite a bit of yarn at nighttime if I'm stuck in the house or if it's rainy. And then from there, once I get this all full, I can take two balls of yarn and I can twist them around each other. Okay, and I can do that on my great wheel too. And here's a little piece of yarn where you can really see the twists going around each other. And by twisting that yarn, it makes your yarn even stronger. And so from there, I can knit or crochet or put my yarn on my loom and I can weave and make all sorts of pieces of clothing that would make us warm for winter time. Because again, we were making our own clothes to keep us warm. Um, here are some examples of things we might have worn. I've got woolen gloves. This jacket's made out of wool. My scarf is made out of wool. Here's some mitts and a little scarf that's made out of wool. All sorts of clothing, pieces of clothing. So that is how folks in the back country on the Carolina frontier, that's how they would make wool, spin wool, so that they could make some woolen clothing to keep themselves warm during the winter months. Thank you. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. Ben Lane will be talking to you about 18th century woodworking. My name is Ben Lane. I am a volunteer here at the museum and the Robert Cleveland uh, log cabin where, where we do some of the demonstrations and so forth and cooking. And I will be showing you guys today, guys and girls, about the woodworking of the 1750s thereabout and how they made things, everyday things, and someone in the family, uh, usually the father, would be educated in the producing of wood for their everyday use, for in the cooking of food, but mainly in the woodworking of things such as hammer handles, axe handles, and other things like that, even to the log cabins and, and the woodwork in the log cabin. They made everything out of stone, wood, or iron. That's the three uh, items that they had to make something. And we'll be doing the woodworking session of it today. So this thing I'm sitting on here is called a shaving horse. It is a horse because you ride it like a horse. You straddle it and ride it just like a horse. And shaving is when you take a draw knife or chisel or one of those planes and take remove wood from it to make an object, knife handles, like I say, or hammer handles, all sorts of handles, and the actual shaving of the wood making the object that you want or need, spoons and so forth. And so that's the general scenario, but most every farm had one of these sawhorses of some design or other. Different parts of the country had a different looking shaving horse. 
And this is a draw knife. There's three of those over there. But they call them a draw knife because it's a knife to begin with, but you draw it to you. You don't cut away from yourself like you do with a normal butcher knife or a pocket knife. This is a draw knife. You draw it to you. The basic idea is they had trees and plenty of trees. One of the reasons they came to America is because we had trees and they made all their objects that they could out of wood because every man of the house, we'll say, had the basic tools that it took to make objects that he needed, furniture even, and to burn wood in the fire. That's the only way they had was to cut wood. So they would saw the tree down. If it was a good tree with good grain in it, he would save it for his tools or for hammer handles, axe handles, hoe handles. He would save this really straight grain wood for that and it's easier to shave it into an, uh, an object that you needed, a tool. And if you made handles for yourself in your farm and uh, you were good at it, you would make handles and things for the community, you know, surrounding you. And uh, that's the way other folks did also, because the blacksmith business, somebody in the community did really good with everything, with something, so they could supply the surrounding community with whatever uh, material they needed. They would take logs and cut them in different lengths for different length handles, of course shorter to burn in the fire, and split those out. They called it busting out, which means to split the wood, and you would split it in squares, and then split it this way, and then you would wind up with squares, something you could bring to the shaving horse, a size that you could handle, and then you could actually make it on into a handle or some other smaller object. But that was the way that they got it. Cut the tree, section up the tree, and get it in a smaller piece of wood, which is more easier to handle on this to get it to the next step. And then they would shave it square or round or just whatever shape they would need. And uh, there's a couple of different ones here that's for finer work or rough work. The bigger one is for getting rid of the a lot of the wood that's in the way. They actually called it waste wood because they didn't waste anything. Even to these uh, shavings of the wood that the draw knife actually makes, we save them to start fires in the forge. That's how we start our fires with, and fires in the fireplace as well. Save every chip, sweep it up, put it in a container of sorts, and build fires. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing wasted when you cut a tree down. So, this could also be the beginning of a gun stock or pistol handle or knife handle. Everything had a, had a beginning and it wasn't like you could go downtown and buy one. There was no town. You had to make whatever you had was totally authentically made or by your neighbor. He may be a blacksmith next door and he could make your iron part and then you could make the handles and make a draw knife. They, these were homemade. So there was a lot of wood going on. Handles, the wagon wheels, the body of the wagon, which would be the bed where you hauled your corn or whatever you were hauling. And it was uh, just the way of life in those times. And uh, it was a good life, but people understood then and had a tremendous work ethic. Hi, I'm R.G. Absher with the Wilkes Street Chapter of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. The next demonstration will be Katie Swain and Leanne Mitchell who will be talking and demonstrating 
colonial games of the 18th century. I'm Leanne Mitchell. And I'm Katie Swain. And today we would like to introduce you all to a few of the colonial kids games. And some of the games can be played by grown-ups too, but I think you're going to like all this. This is called a, for, a what? A whimmy diddle. And it's just a stick that's got little carved grooves. And you put pressure on these grooves with this stick and watch what happens on the end of it. And you have to practice quite a bit. I'm not as good. <laughs> but how would you like to have this for a fan in your house? <laughs> okay, Katie, show them the ball and cup. Okay. And this is the ball and cup, and it also takes lots of practice. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that was perfect. Was. You take after your mama. I know. This, what game does this look like now? It looks like checkers that you would have at your house. But a long time ago, they called this the game of drafts. And this could be played at home. And also, too, they had public meeting houses called pubs. And you would meet and play games or have meetings or have supper by yourself or with your family. But this is, was a very popular game and still is now. And you got different colored men. I know you had know how to play this probably from being at home. But you set up your game pieces and then your player on the opposite does the same and you try to jump over the different colored men and get as many of their opposing men as possible and that would be the winner. Okay, you want to do the box? <clears throat> this is a game called Shut the Box, which was a really, really neat way to teach kids mathematics and their numbers. Um, but what you would do is you would roll the dice. What are your dice made out of? And the dice back then were made out of, they could be made out of wood or bone or sometimes um, during the Revolutionary War period they were actually made from lead musket balls. Um, but the object of the game is to roll the dice. Um, I rolled a seven, so of course you could put down the seven or any combination of numbers to make the seven, like four and three. Uh, and then the object of the game is to get all of these shut so you can shut the box after multiple times of rolling the dice. And this is a slate and these little white things are soap stones. And children during this time did not have a lot of paper. So they would use the soap stone and the slate to do their writing. This would help them practice their penmanship. It would also be used as a, a math board that you could learn how to do your, your math. And it erases easily, so this could be used over and over. And just like at home now, if you have to go out somewhere, you could write a note to your folks or they could write a note to you to slop the hogs. Or you could tell them, I'm hungry, <laughs> please cook me something. But a piece of slate and a piece of soapstone were not hard to come by and they were really valuable to the colonial people. And also there was the game of hoops where they would take the hoops and <clears throat> run with them and hit it along with the stick that is flattened on one edge. And I guess they would race each other. <laughs> I guess they would. And it is not as easy as it may sound. It's not. <laughs> And this is called a water whistle. It's made out of glass. And if you'll look, it looks just like a whistle. It's got little carved edges with a hole in the top of the bird's head and a hole at the very end. And the story is Benjamin Franklin saved up all the money he had earned as a little child and bought one. And he said it gave him so much joy that it was worth every bit that he paid for it. <clears throat> you fill it with water and you blow. But that still is fun, so I can see why he would have not had a sadness about having spent his money. Mm -hmm. Katie, can you do the little man? Thanks, yeah. yeah. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to get his legs to kick up farther. <laughs> there you go, take a bow. Yep. <laughs>
And I think that's it. Of course, cards. And what you'll notice about this deck of cards is it's plain. And then on the side that has your number, we would be used to having a two on this card. That they had to look at the cards and glance and see their numbers instantly. These would have been your face cards, so you'd have to recognize a queen from a jack from a king. And you had to count that one really fast. I haven't even done that one yet, but that's a 10. But anyway, the cards are a little bit different nowadays, but cards have been around for a long time and they're still fun. And I think that's it. Is that good?